Good evening. We'd like to get started. Um, this is the Cape Elizabeth School Board meeting of Tuesday, April 13th. And the first item on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Moving now through our agenda, uh, we move to adjustments. Seeing none, we'll move on to approval of the February school board uh, minutes. March. March. She gave you a new sheet. That's what the... well, She's just trying to trick me tonight. Okay, approval of, should I be working off this agenda? <laughs> Approval of the March school board um, minutes. Any issues or concerns about those? Okay, we'll move on to uh, comments from our high school representatives. Hi, I'm Alicia Chang, junior, Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, I guess Jeff couldn't make it tonight. Um, we had a number of events that have taken place the last month. Um, we had a fine arts night last, last week, which included a number of art exhibits that um, our students have been working on that were um, shown and the jazz band played in our cafeteria. And that was last Tuesday the 6th and Thursday the 8th. Um, on another musical note, our, we had a band competition in Old Orchard Beach last Friday night, um, which we competed against a number of schools, and um, we played our three, three pieces that we had been working on. And um, I don't know the results from that, but I'm sh I'll surely keep you updated when I find that out. Um, spring sports started, um, I don't know exactly when, but sometime in March, I think. And um, we're, we're predicted to have a really strong lacrosse, the lacrosse teams and the baseball team should do really well, along with um, tennis and softball. Um, and the spring musical has started. Um, Mr. Mullen chose Tommy, the musical Tommy, to, to do, and tryouts have finished and rehearsal, rehearsals have started. And that should um, probably be ready by um, sometime late May. And lastly, our, we had um, our math meet um, entered the state competition at the Civic Center, I believe, and um, we did really well and took second place. Um, many individuals from Cape Elizabeth placed, including Brian White, who got selected to, he did really well and he got selected to um, go to the national meet. And our team, um, <coughs> since we took second place, um, we got invited to go to the New England math meet, and that was really good. So that's about it. Any questions or comments? Questions for Alicia? Looks like we're all set. Thank you, okay. Alicia. Thanks. Uh, comments now from our middle school representatives. Hi, I'm Amelia, and this is Marianne. Um, spring has gotten off to a great start for the middle school. The Cape Play Oz was a great success, and everyone did a really good job. It was a great turnout. Um, spring sports also started uh, last Monday, and um, those included lacrosse, track, and baseball. Um, the band and chorus concerts are coming up in May. The 5th and 6th grade one is on the 5th and the 7th, 8th grade one is on the 12th. Um, the 5th grade follow-up to their outdoor experience program will be at Fort Williams on April uh, 27th and 28th and those will be about orienteering. Uh, the 7th the grade is uh, did take the risk behavior surveys uh, this week and we also went to the Boston trip. Um, 
which was a great success and we learned a lot. The student council is giving $50 to the Peace Corp to build a school in the third, in a third world country. And to them, like one of our dollars equals about 40 of theirs. So that'll be a great profit for them. Uh, I'm Marianne. Uh, this week is Foreign Language Week. This year's theme is food. Uh, tomorrow, students will bring in foreign foods uh, to their classes and share them with the entire class. So I'm sure that kids will like that. Um, as usual, we have a daily trivia question. There's a one winner per grade, and kids seem to like that too. They like the prizes. <laughs> um, progress reports are coming out May 7th. Uh, the sixth grade is preparing for their annual trip to Chiwanki, which will be from May 17th through the 21st. Um, I'm sure they are all looking forward to that. High school students came to talk with the eighth grade advisor groups about respect and going into the high school and how to treat people and stuff. And students seem to really enjoy speaking with people just a couple of years older than them. They felt that they could really connect. Um, the eighth grade is going to Augusta on May 11th, and the eighth grade band is going back to the legislature on, again on May 18th to play for them, I guess. Um, and finally, the eighth grade is continuing with their outdoor experiences by going to Fort Williams on May 4th. And that's it. Any questions for Marianne or Amanda? Looks like none. Thank you. Good job. Oh, the play was excellent. <laughs> Kudos to Steve Price and all of the people who helped him and who performed. And there was uh, how many how many students involved? Some phenomenal number. 120. 120 students involved. It's great. Um, we'll now move on to communications. Any from board members? Lieutenant. John. Yes, John. In reference to the minutes that we just uh, passed, there was a paragraph 5B on the communications in reference to you giving the community a report about testifying in Augusta under LD 1215. Mm -hmm. Is there a current update you can share with the community as to how that's being resolved? Um, I don't have one. I'm not yeah, sure I haven't gotten a written report. I, I think the sense of the committee was that it was a local issue, but I've not seen anything in I had a call from uh, Representative Jean Ginn-Marvin, and she basically said that the committee didn't feel that it should be favorable, and they voted not to take it out of committee. Okay. And it was a local issue based on their interpretation of what was being said. Mm -hmm. Other communications? Um, we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Yes, with regret, we have had a teacher resignation from the high school. Christine Newell, who's been a math teacher, is leaving us to assume a position at North Yamas Academy, and we will accept her resignation with regret. Okay. The funding? Right. Uh, we were asked to respond to a resolution, a statewide resolution, on the importance of adequate school funding, and we received a variety of thank yous from Senator Amaro, Senator Pingree, Senator Rand. Representative Brennan, Representative Saxel, Representative Townsend, and Senator Misha, thanking us for supporting that resolution. Okay. We'll move on to uh, the principal's reports, and we'll start with um, Nancy at the middle school. Good evening. Mostly my report is a follow-up to what Amelia and Marianne had to say, but just a few other <laughs> thoughts about that. As Marianne mentioned, we did have the high school students came last Wednesday and worked with advisory groups. The advisors were also present. This is something that we're working on in conjunction with the CAPE Coalition and building up from our asset survey and also with the natural helpers. And we hope to have them come back again in May. And Mr. Dawson and I have talked about a tentative date of May 5th. We need to go to the Cape Coalition meeting in April and check that day, day out with them. And then also we'll find a day in early June as well too once the testing schedule comes out for the high school students so we don't conflict with that. Kathleen Alfiero has worked 
with, worked with the facilitators to train them and get them ready. She comes to us through the coalition and working with that, um, the day was very successful. And as I mentioned the last time, I think when I took this issue to the um, CAPE Coalition, the high school students very readily said we could be a part of that and a part of the solution. It is something that I see that has a future for us and I would hope that next year we could um, have at least one high school facilitator teamed up with each eighth grade advisory group, meeting with them about once a month. And part of the reason is not because anyone's done anything wrong, it's once again to go with the asset survey and to build upward from our strengths and also in recognition that eighth grade is a very difficult year. Um, for most students. Lots of things are changing, things are happening. You're older, but you're not quite old enough yet to do some things. So just to be in support and to make it more of a positive year for everyone and as many avenues as we can, we'd like to take full advantage of that and I'll be exploring that further with the CAPE Coalition. Uh, but the high school students did a wonderful job for us. We had a debriefing meeting with them afterwards. Um, they were terrific and then they headed right back to the high school and got there on time as well too. So very responsible young people and certainly an example of young people giving something back to their community. So I thank them very much for their help in April and look forward to our continued work with them. Also, uh, our eighth, the high school jazz bands invited our eighth grade jazz band to participate with them on the Tuesday night, April 6th, and it was wonderful to go down and to hear all of the jazz bands play. Um, our eighth grade band was outstanding as well too, but to have them watch um, what was ahead of them in high school, if they were one of the participants, and when I watched those eighth grade faces, they were just absolutely entranced and really excited about, wow, look at all the possibilities. So once again, it was great learning and a great moment and a very enjoyable evening. I would be absolutely remiss if I didn't explain to you as many times as possible without being too redundant, um, how wonderful the play has been for us. There are 120 middle school students involved, um, all the way from sound technicians and lighting technicians to um, stage managers to the munchkins to the citizens of Oz to the poppies to the China ladies to many, many things as well as our principal characters of the Tin Man and the Scarecrow and the Cowardly Lion and we have two Dorothys and Toto, um, all of the various witches, good witches, bad witches, whichever one. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful and it's middle school education at its very best. Uh, the week before the play and even a few days before that we had a number of students who stayed late with Mr. Price and worked on scenery, we had many, many parent volunteers, too numerous to, na to name, because if I tried, I'd leave somebody out and that would be very incorrect. Um, but they have just come together and learned together when they perform it, and we will do our last performance tomorrow for um, the students in grades kindergarten through third grade in the morning. They have absolutely done their very best work, cooperated together very well, and also had a wonderful time doing it. And when you see all of that energy together, it's absolutely marvelous. For those of us who work with him, we know that Steve Price is a true gift to us, but if he were standing here, what he would tell you is this. He is very honored to have the privilege of working with the students in the Cape Elizabeth Middle School and enjoys working with them very, very much and just finds this a joy. Um, but it is great, and um, Steve and I are already working on our debriefing meeting. At some points during Oz, we thought maybe we had bitten off a bit more than we could chew. Um, me in a minor way, and Steve in a very major way, because he's involved. However, as we have watched this last week and a half unfold, we know that inclusive theater is exactly what we want to go after. Um, you won't mistake our production for Broadway, but it is a wonderful, wonderful thing to see. So I thank all of the people involved in that for bringing us that opportunity. As Amelia and Marianne mentioned, our fifth grade students will be continuing their outdoor experience with some work at Fort Williams on April 27th and 28th. They are going in teaching teams and they will each, each teaching team will be there for a half a day. They are working in conjunction with the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, who came to one of our team leaders meetings several weeks ago, um, members of that committee. And um, this year we have set up the orienteering trail, but the members of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust are going to be there and work with us, and we hope to continue that partnership in the future and turning our orienteering work into some actual work that will help in better paths and um, other services for the people who visit Fort Williams. 
Additionally, when our eighth grade goes, their last part of their um, outdoor experience is to do something giving back to the community of Cape Elizabeth. And they are working with the Centennial Committee for Fort Williams, and we'll be doing some work with them on May 4th. So they have made connection, connections with that town committee. And that's also two other prime examples of middle school education at its best, um, where they do all of that. Um, other than that, we are all looking forward to um, vacation. It's been a busy time. Amelia and I were meeting before the um, board meeting, and we're just saying, wow, it doesn't sound like we have a lot of super wonderful events to share with you, but indeed we have been very busy in the last eight weeks and uh, are looking forward to vacation and then coming back and um, hitting the rest of the school year with lots of renewed energy. Thank you. Questions for Nancy? Thank you. Um, we'll uh, go to Pond Cove, Tom. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, I'm happy to report that the uh, fourth grade students and I think their teachers survived their encounter with the MEA a couple of weeks ago. I didn't hear uh, quite the volume of the horror stories that are emerging from grade 11, but at a debriefing session with uh, the whole faculty, we did have a few concerns about the MEA that you may share. Um, we were concerned about the length of them. It took nine or ten days at Pond Cove. There were scheduling issues, I think, in all three buildings or around the state. And um, the fact that there's a delay between taking these exams and getting the results, which I hear will be back in um, end of October. It's a letter I got from the commissioner today. For better or for worse, though, the, the teachers were able to check back uh, to match the content of the MEA with the learning results. Um, and my opinion in, uh, is the faculty agrees that it's gonna take a few years to straighten out some of the problems with the test itself, including the format, for us to embed the um, learning results in the curriculum, and uh, for us to get the, the feedback and react to the actual results. But we're done, and uh, we'll, I think administrators will be giving feedback to uh, Augusta soon. Um, I want to express my gratitude to Lyle Kramer, who helps organize uh, the, the logistics of both the MEA and the California Achievement Test when we do this. Without Lyle, wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do it. People have mentioned the uh, middle school drama production. This year, Nancy and Steve have been kind enough to invite all of Pond Cove. Usually it's just one grade. The uh, fourth grade went on Monday, and they gave it rave reviews. I think they're also well behaved. And the, uh, the rest of the school goes tomorrow. We really appreciate doing that. I think it'll spark some enthusiasm for drama in Pond Cove, too. Uh, just a few words about looping. I think most of you are aware through the policy subcommittee discussion that uh, with your approval, we're going ahead after a year of study with a pilot program for, for looping so that we will, beginning, we, we, we will begin a two-year cycle for grade one and grade two next year. That is, we'll have two looping classes in grade one to go one, two, beginning next year, and two looping classes starting next year to go two, three. Um, one of our concerns, implications for placement, but I think uh, by not mentioning the names of teachers, we can keep the process clean and see if we can recruit enough parents and children to uh, have balanced groups. So far, we've gotten some takers, and we have another week or so for people to make up their minds. We'll have an informational meeting if we go forward with this, and uh, I, I think it'll work, and if it does, I think it'll be one more positive thing for the school and for the teachers. Later this evening, you'll be uh, acting on the resignation of uh, Mara Lebano. I just want to say that uh, the whole staff wishes her well. We're really sorry that she'll be leaving. Some of the qualities she brought to her job, besides her background and experience, was her diplomatic, tactful approach to situations, her ability to solve problems objectively. And I think she's just set a very high standard for her successor. I say we wish her well. We're also a little envious. She'll be able to swim outdoors without risk of turning blue. Um, I will personally miss Marla. And, uh, I wish she could have stayed with us longer, but I do believe you have to accept her resignation, <laughs> regretfully. Questions for Tom? Thank you, Tom. Um, high school, Peter. As a school community during this past 
week and a half, we've been dealing with the death of senior Corey Wright. Uh, it's one of those situations that no school uh, ever wants to deal with. Um, but I do want to say that I think that the way that our students and faculty and the uh, faculty of Pond Cove and the middle school that have helped also, the way that they have uh, pulled together at a time like this to provide comfort and support to Corey's family uh, and to one another has been uh, uh, a, a moment to be uh, proud of while, while we're saddened. I think uh, I was thankful time and again uh, during this last week and a half of the kind of atmosphere that exists in the high school, the kind of relationship between, uh, relationship and respect between students and adults in the building that allowed us to be supportive to one another without having to shift gears and, and uh, shift from confrontational to supportive. Um, students helped us to deal with it. I think we helped the students to deal with it. They helped each other. And each person, I think, found their way to provide support to Corey's family and to one another. I, I was um, very proud of students and faculty during this past week and a half. Other items um, tend to pale in comparison, but uh, we'll update you on things that we are thinking about. Um, one, to update, uh, Alicia mentioned the music competition. This was the big band competition, not jazz band. This is our, our curricular uh, wind symphony. And Alicia said they hadn't heard the results yet. Uh, Norm and I were talking this morning and he had received the results. Uh, the, the band scored 89.8 out of 90. Uh, I've asked Norm where those other two tents went. And, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> um, I went down to the competition. They were uh, amazing. They, they had pieces that, uh, uh, that showed their versatility, that were extremely difficult, and yet uh, they performed flawlessly. Uh, was, again, very proud to be associated in some way with them. We will be um, changing our schedule next year. We haven't come up with the final format, but we have come to the realization that um, the way that we currently schedule science labs by using a, a, a double period uh, has, has basically uh, thrown our, our master schedule into a state of gridlock. We just cannot we have no flexibility once we set those science labs. Um, we, we lose student flexibility and we lose uh, administrative flexibility. Um, so uh, a while back we came to terms with the fact that while we do enjoy the 55 minute periods, we needed to find a way that science uh, uh, labs could be taught within the normal uh, schedule. And in so doing, we thought it would be good to provide every class with the opportunity to have at least one uh, longer period in a cycle. And so we're looking at a couple of formats now. Uh, we've uh, talked about it in faculty meetings. Today I presented uh, a couple of alternatives to the student council. They came up with a variation on the theme that I think uh, might have some promise also. Um, Every once in a while, just when we thought we had just the right answer, we'd be reminded of some other complication that, uh, that had not been taken into consideration. Um, one is, and I think it's an important one, and so we're working to, to uh, try to solve, uh, solve it, and I think we have some solutions, is that we, uh, in order to give um, middle school students the kind of flexibility that they need, uh, if they have uh, advanced their study in, in specifically in areas such as mathematics, but also in foreign language sometimes. Uh, some middle school students do take courses in the high school. Um, that necessitates uh, some coordination between the two to make sure that we have some times that will always work for the middle school students. And as I say, I think we've come up with uh, those solutions, but I was glad that um, Nancy and, and a couple of our teachers brought those to my attention as I was cruising through thinking that we had the perfect schedule and all of a sudden realized we hadn't taken that into consideration. 
It will probably be a, um, uh, either a six or eight day cycle uh, with either 50 or 55 minute classes normally, but uh, once in each of those, uh, once a cycle, each class would have the opportunity to have an 85 minute uh, period that would allow labs to uh, take place, uh, but not just in science, in, in any class. Um, we also de decided uh, a while back to take part in a survey that the uh, University of Michigan uh, monitoring the future program uh, has, has been uh, offering. It's actually one of the longer longitudinal studies that's uh, been done on on uh, uh, student behavior and student attitudes. It's been going since 1975. Um, we will use uh, one English class. It will be 10th grade students. And the purpose of the, of the survey will be to learn how students feel about a number of important issues such as education, work, leisure, the environment, drugs, government policies. Those are the major uh, topics. They will be entirely optional. It will, uh, I've sent out a, uh, uh, a letter today to all 10th grade parents. Uh, they can respond if they do not want their son or daughter to take part in the survey. Uh, in addition, once the student is taking the survey, any of the questions are optional. Uh, they do not need to answer any of them. The, report, the results are reported in national terms. Uh, we will not uh, suffer from the, um, uh, the, the type of uh, coverage that uh, apparently happened uh, a few years back with uh, students feeling that they had answered questions anonymously and then the school results being um, uh, featured very prominently uh, in the media. This will be national results so that the University of Michigan reports what 8th, 10th, and 12th grade students are thinking in general about these uh, items. Um, uh, echoing Tom's comments, the, the um, MEA, the recent MEA exams were a real challenge to schedule uh, in the high school. Um, as you may have read, there, there were some uh, districts uh, in the area that um, uh, called off school entirely from uh, whatever their beginning time was, 7.30 or 8 o'clock until 11 o'clock in the morning for all 9th, 10th, and 12th grade students and just had the 11th grade students uh, come in for testing. We opted... Um, the more chaotic uh, approach of trying to run the normal schedule um, while the 11th grade students were uh, testing for an hour and a half or so each of those more each of those seven mornings. Um, I, I still think our approach was the sound one, uh, but it's very difficult for uh, teachers to be pushing forward uh, in their classes when. Uh, so many of our classes are mixed grade level. And so if they had 11th grade students that were in the testing, uh, there was the constant dilemma of whether to push forward and offer any new material or just kind of uh, hold and, and uh, tread water for a bit. So it's a real challenge. I, I was happy to see that uh, in the letter that the commissioner sent to us uh, today that Tom alluded to, the um, questions uh, that, that he spoke uh, of in this letter um, that were raised by many educators throughout the state um, very definitely reflect our concerns. Um, the types of questions, whether it is possible or not to cover all of the subject areas in a test like that, um, the length of time, the disruption to the school day, and what does a high school do in that situation when you do have students uh, uh, in classes across grade level. Uh, so I do hope that you know, there will be some progress. This is the first year. Um, I, I do hope there will be progress made in the, in the near future. Finally, I want to add my congratulations to the math team. Um, we will be going to the New England Regionals for the first time in several years. And as uh, Alicia mentioned, Brian White will be going to the national uh, competition. So I think the types of things that Alicia mentioned, the, the three ring circus that was the high school Tuesday and Thursday night uh, last week with ninth grade science fair going on on the third floor, the art show on the second floor, and the jazz cabaret on the first floor, um, the math results, the music uh, results all speak, I think, to uh, a school where students are achieving at very, very high levels not only in athletics, but in, in the arts and in academics. And uh, I want to salute them for that. Uh, in the, the math team, 
This year is coached by David Greeley and Roger Rio. I think that's it. Questions for Pete? I just had a, I don't know if it's a question to any of the administrators. Um, it's the fact that we're not going to get results back from the MEAs for six months or more, um, does that have an effect on how we look at those results? Or is there anything that we can do with those results at that point, or is it too late? Uh, it, it, in the past, we've gotten them by the end of the school year, I believe. Is that, is that correct? Uh, it, it certainly makes it more difficult to address uh, possible gaps. Uh, I, I guess from, I speak from my standpoint, if it, if it comes three months later, the, the summer is often very good time to be looking at those results and saying, ah, looks like we've uh, you know, hit uh, this particular problem. Uh, uh, what are we going to do about it uh, to receive them in October? Uh, when you're all, already midstream, makes it difficult to address right then. Obviously, you can still be planning uh, if there's anything major that comes up, and, and you still can plan, but it lowers the effectiveness um, of them, I think. And it, it puts them so far, you know, that, that uh, ends up being six months away. And when you get results six months after whatever it was that you did uh, to, uh, to garner those results, it, uh, it does tend to lose some, uh, some effectiveness. We did have, because of the nature of the questions this year, uh, for the first time in a long time, uh, my understanding from uh, teachers that, that have been in the high school for a while, um, we've never, uh, or at least for several years, have not had to um, convince students of the value of the test. They, they understood that it was important to do their best. They took them seriously. Uh, they realize that part of our school's reputation is built upon, you know, some, whether we agree with it or not is another issue, but we realize that those reputations are built on test results. And so they took it seriously. But uh, this year's test did uh, an awful lot to erode the test credibility. Students were saying, you really want us to take this seriously when, when this type of question is asked? And it only took, it, those, those questions that were really that were questionable um, we're a small percentage but it only takes a few of those questions for for students to start saying oh this thing is and so it was very challenging this year to keep them focused and trying their best Peter um, do we Let's respond to that, that same question real quickly and then I'll give it back to him um, I also agree with Peter a lot obviously the test won't give us a lot of information about individual students because so much time and learning time will have passed from when they took them to when we have them back that their many of the profiles may have changed significantly. I think it might help us in looking at the types of questions that we ask when we pick out the ones that we consider to be valid questions. And um, in the past, it also has helped us look at some of our curricular issues. I think those will hold true, Keith, but I think part of that one of the big questions we have for the whole process is that delay in return time. Um, and hopefully there can be something that will shorten that up. I would also say our eighth graders have always taken it seriously and done their very best, but by day six, they were very tired and exhausted and sort of like, haven't we about wrapped this up? And a number of students, a number of students, a number of teachers noticed that by day seven, um, students were finished with the exam opportunity much earlier than they were earlier in the week, and I think it was a reflection of just being tired of doing that. So all of those things we have to mix in with when we get the results, um, and it will be a learning process for all of us. Yeah, well, the, one of the reasons I asked the comment, and I think Pete mentioned it, is to, if we don't get the results until October, I would assume that it would be October at the absolute earliest. Uh, you know, we have to have some time to uh, study those results, and it might be January before we come up with any sort of uh, you know, evaluation of maybe what we're not covering in the curriculum. So we really lost a whole year of programming at that mm -hmm. point in order to try to adjust to it. And uh, that's it's, that's correct. It's My understanding, I, I think we may get some writing results back, but we need uh, before the end of the year. Um, but I'm not sure what, if that means before July 1st or before June 1st. And the writing they did take in November. So, and I'm not sure that's a definite that we're going to get those back. So even then, there's a long there's the summertime to look at them. That's an advantage. Um, but as far as it really telling you anything about an individual student, um, this isn't the test for that at this moment in time. Peter, just um, 
as part of the superintendent's report, uh, we, uh, she accepted uh, the, the resignation of Chris Newell, and I didn't want to um, just sort of fly past that. Uh, if you wanted to take the opportunity to um, address that. Uh, I would definitely want to uh, echo Cynthia's words that we would accept with uh, regret. Um, I talked with um, Rick DeFusco uh, yesterday at, at a uh, game, uh, uh, accused him of recruiting uh, staff uh, from us. Uh, he has very good taste, uh, and he uh, uh, certainly is uh, uh, getting uh, an outstanding teacher that's done a great job uh, for us. So we will, we will miss uh, Chris tremendously uh, when she first had mentioned to me that she was applying for the job and then that she had uh, been offered the, the position. I did say that, uh, you know, that took some liberties and said that the board has to approve this where it's not really a matter of approval and I was recommending no. Um, but, but Chris does have very strong ties to NYA from the past. It's not uh, uh, just the fact that uh, Rick is there. Um, uh, she has, members of her family have, uh, have gone and will be going uh, to the school and, and it made it very attractive to her for that reason. She's also going to be uh, department head uh, for 6 through 12, so they obviously recognize the, the uh, talent and leadership abilities that we see in Chris, so uh, she will be sorely missed. Uh, we have not started the interviewing, we've advertised for that position, but have not started the interviewing process, the deadline. Uh, and that one is uh, the 23rd of uh, April, I think. Okay. Other questions? I just wanted to echo how much we will miss Chris. She is a wonderful teacher, and I had the privilege of sitting in on one of her classes, and she has a great rapport with the kids, and um, she's a real loss. Thanks, Peter. Moving on to committee reports, we'll start with uh, the finance subcommittee. Keith. Uh, we met earlier this evening, uh, signing the warrants. Uh, we, we have a preliminary uh, estimate of the, what the increase in the, our health insurance plan uh, is going to be, and it's looking like it's going to be in the 10% range. Uh, we've been uh, able over the past couple of years to not have any increases, so I guess we have to take one big lump. Uh, that represents about $75,000 towards our, to our budget, so that's a fairly significant piece of, of uh, money for the, uh, the health benefits. Uh, we've just completed our budget uh, workshops and so forth, and, and one of the uh, great unknowns of the whole budget process is the state, uh, the state funding uh, appropriation, and, and currently we are uh, projecting it to be uh, 200 and almost $218,000 less than we got last year. So uh, our state funding continues to decrease as our, as our budget <coughs> continues to increase. Uh, we, we looked briefly at the food service report and uh, at the June finance uh, committee meeting, we're going to be discussing and, and evaluating as to whether or not the uh, Lunch, uh, lunch uh, price increase is going to need to happen. I guess our revenues are up, so there's still some question as to whether we need to raise the prices on our, uh, our lunch program. Uh, and we uh, briefly reviewed the appropriation report. Okay, thank you. Uh, policy subcommittee. Kevin? Policy subcommittee has met twice since our last uh, school board meeting. At the earlier meeting, um, we generated three policies which will come forward for first readings later on in this meeting and we'll cover those at that point. Um, our most recent meeting revolved around placement issues dealing with looping um, and we have asked the administrators at Pond Cove to draft administrative guidelines for uh, placement in the looping program that will uh, mirror the existing placement policies. That's it. Our next meeting will be on Wednesday, May 5th at 9 o'clock in the uh, Jordan Conference Room. Uh, I expect we will primarily be discussing uh, the looping placement issues. 
and there are a number of other issues um, that we need to ad begin addressing, truancy, um, fundraising, and a few other issues. Hopefully we'll get to those as well. Okay, thank you. Um, we want to move into uh, any unfinished business? Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to new business. And uh, the first item is consideration of the adoption of a proposed FY2000 school budget. And uh, shall we have uh, Keith intro do the intro on Yeah, I'll just do a brief uh, synopsis. Uh, the board has met in several workshops, as many of you know, and many of you have been there. And uh, uh, we really appreciate all your input, by the way. Uh, the original budget that we were presented with around the 1st of March was approximately uh, $13,100,000, somewhere uh, right around there, and that's an approximate number. Uh, through the workshops and so forth, uh, the board has trimmed approximately $100,000 off, uh, off that budget. Uh, and the figure that we've ended up with at this point uh, is $12,981,072, and I'll make a formal motion on that in a moment. Uh, we have some tough issues, uh, we still have some tough issues dealing with our budget. Uh, the state uh, appropriation, of course, is a major piece. Uh, it's, it's possible that it's going to be the number that we're planning on right now, but it's also very possible to go either way. So we were really still uh, in the dark about what that final number uh, is going to end up looking like. Uh, we have some built-in increases in our budget uh, where uh, our uh, salaries and benefits uh, increases, which are, are negotiated uh, through collective bargaining and so forth, uh, that every year runs us uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars. And uh, again, I'm just throwing out some broad figures. Uh, we have requests for new staff that we've supported uh, uh, in the amount of about $210,000 for the year. So uh, I think the board needs to be commended in the, in the job that you have all done uh, in coming up with the final figure that, that we have. It, uh, I believe, is a responsible budget. It, 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 uh, it's, it's based on our goals and uh, based on the needs of the district. And uh, personally, I really appreciate the input of both the, the public and certainly our administrators and staff. Uh, I guess at this point, I'd like to make a formal motion that we adopt the budget for fiscal year 2000 in the amount of Twelve million nine hundred eighty-one thousand and seventy-two dollars. Uh, this represents a three hundred ninety-seven thousand dollar increase, which is a three point one six percent increase in the uh, over last year's budget. Okay. Is there a second on the motion? Second. Second and uh, discussion. Comments. Yeah. George, I just wanted to um, explain my, what my vote will be on this. I am going to vote against the budget, and not because I thought the process, I thought the process was great. I think we went through every line item. We had great input and feedback. And I don't think there's much money to cut out of this budget. I guess it's the first year, though, I felt like we didn't really make any hard, hard cuts. And at the end of six years, the budget has gone from under $9 million to over 12 now. And we haven't really had any change in population. And as I get ready to pay my April 15th taxes to the federal government, I guess I just see spending going, going, going. And I feel like it's everybody's job to try to hold the line and make very difficult choices. And this board did a great job. And you know, who knows where we would end up cutting more money, but I guess at this point, I can't, um, I, won't, I won't vote for this budget. Mm -hmm. And I said that at the end of our last workshop, and that was fun. Other comments in terms of the budget? Um, <clears throat> sure. I'll, um, I think that the whole budget process is a committee process, and all members of this board bring a different perspective uh, and which is the reason for a seven-member board. And individually, we may be able to cut specific items that we personally might think uh, aren't 
won't necessarily seriously impact on the quality of our school system. But together as a board, I don't think we can make any further cuts. Um, because what I might personally want to cut isn't something that necessarily three other members of this board would feel needed to be cut. Uh, I think we've gone through this budget process um, seriously, and we've scrutinized and reviewed it uh, and considered input from the administrators, the teachers, the public, and we've made cuts where a majority of the board felt it appropriately, uh, felt it appropriate to make those cuts and ultimately developed the current budget that um, <coughs> Keith has uh, proposed. Uh, and I feel that it should be supported. Other comments from board members? I'll ask a couple of questions for clarification. To who? To who? who either Keith or uh, Pauline. Okay. Uh, under the original printout that we received, the un use of undesignated surplus was 250000 The printout in the brochure that we just got, the booklet we just got, it was 285812 I was wondering where did the $35,812 come from? The board had approved uh, the carry forward from the renovation project of $35,812. And that's where that additional revenue came from. Okay. Now, what would that leave in the surplus account, on designated surplus, once it that's would, subtracted from? Does it still leave $104,000? Yes, it does. Okay, so there's $104,000 still in the surplus account. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I'll, make, I'll just make the comment that what, we, what this board does is it works on um, the development of a needs-based budget. It's a, a very difficult, um, disciplined process. Um, we have been through it um, been through it a few times, and uh, collectively this board has been through it many times. Um, I feel very good about the budget that's being moved on to the town council, and that will happen tomorrow night. Um, and uh, that will be an, an important meeting. I think that the board succeeded in establishing some very key goals for, for 1998-99, and, and also uh, assuming that those will be our key goal areas in the future we use those to prioritize the spending. It, it is a very difficult process. We did have good input from the public, um, but I believe that it, it truly is a needs-based budget that is being presented to the town council and would fully expect and, and certainly hope with, with a great deal of hope that, that, they will, um, that they will accept that and pass that budget. Um, uh, Josh, I have a few comments when you finish. Yes. So I didn't mean to interrupt. Yep. I, you were um, I think this, this board has been uh, very diligent uh, in their work um, and very committed to studying uh, um, as well. The administrative team here has done an outstanding job in preparation and providing detail, giving us answers and providing good rationale um, for building uh, the needs that drive the budget. So I'm, I'm very pleased uh, with the results that we have. John. Okay, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, after the last budget meeting, uh, I had an uneasy feeling after we had finished. Uh, uh, we went around, and of the seven of us, I think there were numerous uh, instances where there were three people that were in favor of making a reduction, and there were four that wouldn't go along with it. I think if you took that collectively out of the seven of us, there was probably a good 50,000 or plus that we probably could have put our finger on and made a reduction. So I went home, made some notes, and as I probably told you before, I usually network with 16 to 20 people within the town to either call me or I get in touch with them to, to feel their pulse as to how they feel about this budget. And I went back in history. Before I was elected to the school board, I came to a budget meeting here one, one Saturday morning, and I was told that there was no area for additional cuts. This was before I was elected. Well, lo and behold, the next year, there was $275,000 that was sitting in the account that was a surplus. Granted, $75,000 came from additional funds from the state, 
but the other 200,000 was comprised of a contingency amount or savings in the other accounts. Now here we are, we're putting together a budget this year and we don't have all the figures in front of us how this is going to work out at the end of June. Now I've had a lot of phone calls and conversations with Pauline, she's been extremely helpful, all the administrators have, all the parents. I just feel I have to concur with uh, Beth that I will not vote for this budget either. I still feel that there's additional cuts that can be made. I think we have to uh, revisit some of these areas. I have uh, outlined them. I don't think it's necessary for me to share them with you at this time, but I could easily come up with fifty to $98,000. And for every 7000 you save, that's one penny on the tax rate. If you took out the contingency of $70,000, that would be 10 cents. We've got 104 sitting in the surplus. We were able to tap the 250. I just don't think it's right that we should keep continuing taxing the public and having the money end up in the surplus. And based on my conversation with Pauline today, she feels that we're going to end up at the end of June with no commitment from her. We're going to be in good shape. We're going to have more money to go back into the surplus. So at this point, I will not support the budget as presented and feel that additional cuts can be made. I had hoped not to have to do this. I thought my vote would speak for itself. Um, I would associate myself with Jennifer's remarks that each one of us individually may come up with things that are not our particular priority and suggest that item be cut from the budget. And whether we tried that on any number of items and none of those items succeeded. I am therefore convinced that we collectively as a school board have put together a reasonable, rational budget to present to the town council, and I support that budget. I'd like to make a, just a comment to the surplus um, to John. Uh, one out of district placement would wipe out that surplus in a nanosecond. Um, so I think having the surplus is not uh, a frivolous idea. Other comments? Um, I would just I would just point out that um, this came uh, this budget came forward out of final um, final committee that uh, the board had um, with the full support with the exception of Beth who shared her concerns at that time. So um, if there are no other comments, then what I would do is ask for a vote, and it's all those in favor um, to. Excuse me, John. So we're going to open it up for the public. There's people from the. I, out here might want to speak on I, budget. I would be happy to do that. If you could come up to the podium, you'll need to um, identify yourself and make your comment. Good evening, I'm Trish Brigham. I guess I have a question. Um, First, I'm not sure where, Beth, you're getting the $9 million figure because I have budgets that were provided to me from Pauline that have 10-6 for a 94-95 expenditure. That's six years ago. Um, and I guess the next question is, but you make a very valid point, and so does John, in terms of presenting our budget to the taxpayers. Say this $3 million difference. Has any analysis been done? I attempted to do this, but there's been a lot of reallocation among the monies in the budget, so it's very difficult to compare. But as in business, I think three to five year comparisons are very important, and they can send, give a lot of information. I guess my question is, just looking at the budget, $325,000 is technology that we didn't have to fund three to five years ago. As a community and a school board and a school system, we've supported that. Has any attempt been made by category teaching, how much of it is actually contract, 3% compounded for five years, to come up with really what the differences are over the past five years. If we present it like that, it might not look that bad. And it might say, these are our priorities. This is the legacy the school board wants to leave with the town. We support technology. We support this. And we've been doing all this in an environment where our state funding, for whatever reason, I guess I had a question on why it keeps cutting, getting cut also if they keep changing the formula, in an environment where our money, our support is you know, being decreased. I'm just curious, I tried to do it, but I don't have the history, I haven't been here long enough 
to know what got reallocated, and or if that might be something going forward in the budget process to at least take the past two years and reformulate them so that they are, we are comparing apples to apples. But I think that might help in the town council presentation if we say, X percent of the increase went to technology. We had no choice, you supported that. X percent went to, and it might not, some of it we have no control over. I mean, 3% over five or six years is gonna add up. Insurance, we don't have control over it. We have a critical mass of teachers, which if they supported the budget last year, in theory, they supported that critical mass of teachers. Just a question, I guess, and maybe something to think about going forward to improve the process. I think uh, um, uh, Keith can address this, but um, I'll just speak to what his presentation was last year and what I um, know it will be this year. And, and it is, um, it is very specific. It, it is very, uh, um, very much category by category, and and does address in many ways kind of uh, leveling the pl the playing field in terms of uh, looking at a, a big jump. But when you when you really look at it and you look at the component pieces, uh, there are there are many things that are not negotiable. They are they are automatic increases. And I think he does a nice job, so that the town council does have a good sense about. Um, what the difference is, we're talking about $397,000. Sounds like a big chunk of money until you start breaking it down into its component parts as, you're, uh, as it sounds as though you're suggesting and, and suddenly a lot of it is, is, is not, um, doesn't, doesn't have a lot of movement to it. Right. Or even more than just a one year comparison mm -hmm. because certain shifts like a, a one placement makes it all out of whack. I mean, actually in comparison, at least I tried to compare the Pond Cove, we went down a few, three years ago. So when you look from 94 to 95, 95 to 96 to 2000, we're really only up $80,000 in a four year time period in one school. That's really not a lot of money. Plus more than half of the increase is in salary and benefit, more than 50%. So. Actually our biggest jump happened with the building project too. Yeah. We suddenly had debt to deal with. Yeah, that happened in that five year window. Period. And then we had renovations that are, that are new last year. <coughs> It's, it, you make a good point. Thank you. Uh, just to quickly address the state funding formula, yeah. uh, it's it's uh, it's the formula changes every couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, in the past, it's been uh, based on a lot of different circuit breakers about how far it could move. But the two primary areas uh, that they look at are property values and uh, income levels. I believe, is that, the, is that the right? They added that a number of years ago. And being the community we, we are, Thank you. we don't get a lot of sympathy in that area. And, uh, and now there's uh, the current formula, with, which is costing us over $200,000, is to get rid of any of those circuit breakers so that there's, if, if we lose too much at one time, it'll be made up uh, to a certain level and that certain level is, is not existed anymore. So right now, the only thing it's being based on is property values. And even if King supports more money for education, we probably won't see a lot of No, that's right. Probably won't. Thank you. Patsy. Hi, I'm Patsy Katzos, and I just have a couple points I'd like to add. Uh, one is that uh, I think we have to remember that we are experiencing some increased expenses to meet our responsibility uh, to achieve the main learning results. Uh, my other point is that I don't really see a problem for taxpayers with having surplus money uh, left at the end of the budget year. I think if anything, it just shows uh, fiscal responsibility and restraint uh, on spending. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you do make a good point. I think if, if the budget were to be summarized in terms of being driven by a few things that would a big one of those big things is main learning results. Another is addressing um, a very broad spectrum of need that we have that continues to, to grow um, as a broad spectrum of need. Uh, someone brought up technology and our commitment to technology and a five year revolving plan around that. Legal fees, um, one of those things that uh, we would love to be able to cut back on those, but um, Sometimes we're just not able to. Um, so you, you throw a, a few of those things together and make commitments to um, in areas like staff development and you find yourself 
um, increasing the budget 390 some odd thousand dollars. Other comments from board members or from the public? And seeing none, um, yes, sir. Uh, Frank Potenzo, Ivy Road. I've lived in Cape 41 years in the same house. I've seen uh, property taxes go from 400 a year to now at my property over 3,000 a year. I'm retired and the 1999 Social Security increase 1.3% increase. The school budget looks to me like it's uh, about 3.16% increase. The state of Maine ranks 36 in what's left of money that a person can spend, but that doesn't pertain to Cape Elizabeth because of our residents, of all the residents in Cape, 50% uh, and this is on the low side, start at 50,000 a year and up. It's probably 17, 18% make over 100,000 in Cape. <clears throat> I'm quoting figures from two to three years ago, the Thomas Memorial Library put out a readership survey. And in that survey, they asked how many hours you use library and they also asked what your income was. And this was printed in the Cape Courier. And it uh, looked interesting to me. I cut it out and I've had it all these past couple of years. <clears throat> the stage production Cabaret had a fabulous song called Money Makes the World Go Round. If one has unlimited funds, there's practically no concern as to what things cost. Don't even think about it, just get it, pay it, keep on going. If you have very little money, you're in a property in a poverty level and receive aid. And there aren't many people in Cape Elizabeth in that category. If you're in a, a, a median group, and also retired, you have to weigh what is necessary in your home and what is luxury. And I think one of the problems is that we have a lot of residents in Cape Elizabeth who have plenty of money and are not concerned with what you good people are doing every year, working hard to come up with a budget. A couple of things that I've looked at, that the median value of a house in Cape Elizabeth is now $214,000. This is 1998 figure that came from the town hall. 214,000, there are a lot of people in this town right now <coughs> that are in that low of 50% that are hurting. In my area alone, in Cape Cottage Woods, there's five houses for sale right now. And as I look around the Cape, there are a lot of houses for sale. Now, I don't know whether the people are moving because of uh, property tax reasons or because of health or retirement or, or what. But when you have a town that 80% of the town residents have no children in the schools. 20%, 20% have kids in school. And that means that 80% is paying for 20. And it would seem to me that if 10 to 20% of 
the people that have no kids in school, if they sold their homes today or next month, and those homes had anywhere from two to four bedrooms, that could be a catastrophe for this town, the way money is spent on the school side. Because that would mean that you would have more people selling homes, <clears throat> more people moving in with kids into these homes that have retired people in them, either one or two people with no kids in these homes. Now all of a sudden, you could have 10 to 20 percent of these homes that now have children, more kids going to school, more problems, uh, more money. So in your own homes, you have a priority list of what is necessary to do and what is luxury. And if you, and, and if you find it difficult to pay for the luxury, you do without it. Now, I was reading somewhere about long-term school teachers in the CAPE system who retire, who are at the top of their salary uh, cap or whatever. And when they retire, a, a new re teacher is hired, a replacement. And I wonder if this replacement comes in at that same salary level that the tenure teacher left, or if their salary is a lesser salary to start with for the new teacher. Unlike the new superintendent of schools that's going to be getting more than what our last superintendent got, and about $10,000 more than what he got from his last job, but he probably has the experience and the education to warrant the salary he's going to get. But I just feel that there are some areas that uh, can be uh, re-looked at, uh, some additional cuts made. Uh, some of the surplus money, I think, should be used to reduce the tax rate now and not next year or two years down the road. I thought when, that when I found out that the town, on the town side, they took over the two million plus dollars uh, for building a new swimming pool, that that would relieve the school side of that money come out of your budget. And I says, well, there's some money they don't they don't have to spend, so maybe the tax rate won't go up. But I haven't seen that. Now you <clears throat> want to raise it three point something. Uh, so anyway, if I just wonder if uh, if any of you want to <laughs> comment on <laughs> on any on any uh, point that I've touched here, uh, ask me where I got my, my figures and my thoughts, uh, you know, feel free. Uh, but I just feel that there are a lot of people in Cape right now that are hurting, and it's every year is an increase, every year, every year. And, uh, oh, it's only $150 a year more, or $170 a year more or whatever. But somewhere along the line, there's got to be some cuts made. It's nice to have everything, but sometimes you can't have everything. So you have to make some cuts. And I just wonder, no matter whether it's a school board or a, or a, a company committee or whatever, that you work so darn hard that you you have those blinders on and you're looking at the problems and you forget about what's outside. That you're concentrating so hard on this, this, and this, and you forget that there are maybe some other ways of doing this instead of saying, we need this, we need this, we need this. Do we really need it? 
told Mike McGovern once, town hall looks beautiful. What are you going to spend money on, on now? You know, what are you going to do, put awnings over all the windows? Extra money. Is it neat? Is it necessary? So anyway, that's some of my comments. And some of my neighbors feel the same. I know Jennifer doesn't. She's a neighbor of mine. <laughs> Well, I've got some comments, too. But she's got kids in school. But uh, as I said, there's uh, a lot of people in Cape don't have kids in school, and they're beginning to worry quite a bit about this ever-increasing, ever-increasing. Thank you very much. Thank you much. for your comments, and, and uh, um, I'll allow the board members to respond. I, I, um, I know that you answered a question that I, I'd like to provide, um, or you asked a question that I'd like Whatever. to provide. Whatever. I've got a couple. Yeah. One, new teachers don't come in at the same salary level as someone who went out. They come in at a beginning teacher salary. Okay, so there's a saving there. Right. Well, we yeah. hired the best qualified person right. for the job, so we might hire someone <coughs> in higher than the person that they're replacing. Okay, so if a teacher's making, say, 42000 a year and she retires, you could hire a teacher that could do the same job for, say, 32000 We don't or, have persons the best applicant for the job. Best, all right. If you had an applicant who had uh, tenure or years in service or whatever as the retiring teacher and was getting a comparable salary, then you would pay that teacher the same as the outgoing teacher. That's right. Okay. Um, second of all, with respect to the budget, 71% of the budget, or more than that, is salary and benefits, which is negotiated increases. Our 71 percent of the budget, okay, we don't have any control over, essentially. And our increase, more than 50 percent of the increase, is just the increase, the contracted increase in the salary and benefits. And then I guess back to this 80-20 thing. This is a community, Frank. And when your kids were in school, there were retired people who didn't have children in school who were paying when your kids were in school. Well, I'm older than you, and things didn't cost so much 30 years no, ago as they, they do today. No, but they did perspective. <laughs> Percentage-wise, they did. Percentage-wise, they did, Frank. But I was working full time then. You were, but the guy down the street who was 65 and wasn't working anymore was well, still paying his taxes to put your children. 30 years school. ago, the number of people in Cape was uh, were uh, they were a lot less than there are now. Okay. Well, I won't argue that. So, I think as a community, that's what you need to do as a community. And when I'm retired, I'll be paying for the kids who aren't even born yet. And I would expect that if I want my community to grow and be a good community. That's one of the costs I have to bear. Well, another concern is that a lot of these people that are high income people want 100% services uh, uh, while their kids are in school. And a lot of them, when the kids graduate from high school, they move out of town. And that, that leaves the rest of us here. So you have to weigh things when, when you get phone calls from people that they want extra teachers. Uh, to teach uh, languages in kindergarten in the first grade, or they want this, they want that. Uh, you have to be able to say, uh, uh, I don't think we can afford it. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, well, we'll if, if I don't think it's needed. I instead of saying we'll debate it, we'll bring it to a meeting and this. Just, just say we can't afford it. We've gotten along with it before. Why do we have to? Do it now. There are other things. There are other things. Well, it's a little more complicated. Some of this I know, is I'm, mandated I'm, by the state. I'm simplifying I mean, things. Right. Uh, but still. Uh, I mean, you know my car is 10 years old, Frank. I don't spend money <laughs> <laughs> frivolously. And we, and we probably want to move on move okay. beyond the, the neighbor you know, exchange. <laughs> um, right. it's, I mean, it's pleasant for us to be a part of it. but. Um, and, and Frank, thank you very much for your comments. Thank you for your time. Certainly. Uh, what I'd like to do right now, um, absent any other one from the public who would like to speak, um, or board members who have comments, uh, we will, yes. Yes, I, um, I, I just want to come on up. You know, you can come up to the podium. Uh, you'll in, need to introduce yourself, and, and I will limit the discussion to five minutes. Thank you.
Um, my name is Mary Takash, and I live on Old Fort Road. And while I appreciate the gentleman's comments, and I have heard it a lot since I moved to this town, how the older generation is footing the bill for the younger generation to go to school. I appreciate what Jennifer said as far as this is a community and the younger generation is footing the bill for the older generation to retire. We both help out each other. We pay our taxes so that people can retire and have Social Security and Medicare. And it's, it's, it's a way that each generation helps each other. And uh, it's got to be balanced. So I just <clears throat> wanted to add that point. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Another comment, and again, I uh, impose the same restriction. Terry Ann Scriven, I live off of Mitchell, Mitchell Road, and um, I just had three brief comments, if I can remember the three of them. The first is to um, the speaker who spoke before, uh, Ms. Takash, and I'm not sure, Frank, last name? Batenzo. Batenzo. I wanted to address the 80%, um, 20%, and suggest after uh, working years in the medical field that perhaps the 80% in town are also benefiting from the excellent school system that we maintain, and these people work hard to uh, budget each year. When most people have a long life in the United States, and when they get to the point that they do need medical care or assisted care living, the elderly in this town benefit a great deal from the property values that they um, have uh, when they do have to sell their homes and move into assisted care living. It might be something to think about that over the years, actually, with the improvement of this community and maintenance of an excellent school system, that that is something that is basically money in the bank for you, and you do have that value as being part of this community where other people, young and old, have supported a school system. Something that I think is very important and often overlooked um, by aging patients that I have been in contact with. Um, the second thing would be that I, I don't think the school board has proceeded with blinders on. I do think that they have made some very difficult cuts in the budget this year and previous years. I know a number of my neighbors who have school-aged children that do not even have their children in this school system and have chosen to go elsewhere for those luxury items that you were talking about that you think this school board has incorporated here yet they continue to pay their property taxes and support the school system, not reaping the benefits whatsoever from having their children in the school system here. The third point, I know I'm short on time, is that I'd like to um, address both to Beth and to John Ridge. I'm a member of the public who has voted for you and supported you. It's not enough for me to know that you are going to vote against this budget. You're an educated member of the school board you know things I don't know, and if you can't come up with the specifics to cut and discuss them tonight, I think that you as an informed individual cannot vote against a budget unless you can share with the public those specific things that you should cut from the budget that would make it acceptable to you. I'd appreciate hearing first from Beth and then John on those two points. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other comments? Seeing none, I am going to um, move to a vote. Um, and what I and let's just be real specific about what we're, do, what we're doing here. We are now voting, and I'm going to ask all those in favor to uh, have a show of hands in terms of officially adopting the FY 2000 school budget of twelve million nine hundred eighty-one thousand and seventy-two dollars, um, as came out of our workshop on March twenty-third. Uh, all those in favor? That's five. All those opposed? Two. The uh, motion carries. <coughs> We're going to move on now to um, consideration of policies for first reading. I'll turn this over to Kevin. How about the calendar? Calendar. Oh, <laughs> I had it circled, so I thought I already went by it. Um, the next item is the calendar for the school year 90, 99 zero, zero. And um, Beth, could you, or Beth or John? Uh, Cynthia. Okay. I'll just quickly review it for those who have not uh, seen a copy of it, and then we can open it for discussion. Uh, the proposed calendar for next year 
has two teacher days, the 30th and 31st of August, with the students starting on September 1st. And the remainder of the month of September is uh, as printed. October, we have one holiday, Columbus Day, and family conferences will be on the 21st and 22nd, with the 21st being an early release day with no kindergarten sessions, and the 22nd, day, 22nd being a no school day for students. In November, we have Veterans Day holiday. And then just as with this year's calendar, there will be no student days during Thanksgiving week. So that's the week of the 22nd through the 26th. However, the 22nd and 23rd will be teacher workshop days. In December, the winter vacation will start on the 23rd, which is a Thursday, and extend through with the children returning on the 3rd of January. We have Martin Luther King Day in January, also, that's the 17th. February, we have winter vacation at the traditional time, which is the 21st through the 25th. In March, we have an early release day on the 22nd with no kindergarten sessions. In April, we have spring vacation at the same time as usual, which is the 17th of April through the 21st of April. In May, we have Memorial Day, the 29th. Did I miss one? Yes. I'm sorry, I missed the, I missed the 5th, which is an early release day in April. Uh, May, we have Memorial Day on the 29th. And in June, we have high school graduation on the 11th, and that is a change from a past. That is a Sunday. And with five storm days, the last day of school for the remainder of the students will be the 19th of June. Okay. I'll just make a couple of comments. Um, my goal in doing the calendar is always to try to balance as many full weeks as we can get for the kids. Um, with the needs of the staff to have staff development and conferences. And the only day that I was opposed to, and it was just me and the student rep, was the um, April 5th early release day for staff development. And I could buy in that the teachers needed the early release, uh, sorry, early release days in the middle of the weeks for the conferences, because it really made sense that parents were more likely to come in the evening if it's a Wednesday night. But I had a hard time buying into the 5th, which was a Wednesday. We would have had just two weeks before that an early release day in the middle of the week for conferences, and then two weeks later, one for staff development. And I wasn't opposed to an early release day for staff development. It was more the placement. Could we do it on a Friday before February vacation, before April vacation, before Memorial Day, any of those places so that the kids' week wasn't another student week wasn't as disrupted. And the staff made a very good point that it's better for them to have those days in the middle of the week, because then the staff is more focused and all. But I did feel that we compromised on the October one, which was putting conferences the week after Columbus Day. So we've got a broken week with Columbus Day, and then the next week's broken again with conferences, because that was better for the teachers. I, so that was the only one that I had an issue with, and I was certainly in the minority. OK. Um, just the opposite um, point of view from the rest of the committee, the calendar committee. Um, on those two early release days, one in April and the other one, I think, is in March, um, the teachers spoke of um, Wayne Fleet in particular which has early release days every Wednesday afternoon. And some of the logic and reasoning for that is when you move it to a Friday or you move it to a Thursday, there's no incentive for the kids to be back in school and to be focused on what's going on. When we do an early release day in the middle of the week, they come back to school. They have a full day on Thursday. They have a full day on Friday. Um, all of the members of the committee, with the exception of Beth, um, thought that that sounded like a great idea that we should try, that we should test it for this year and see how it works. Because in the past, our early release days have been mostly on Fridays. Um, and a lot of the comments um, from teachers was that you don't have the kids there. They're, They're not, not there. <laughs> right. Well, and a lot of them aren't in school, that's right. true. 
Um, so, and, and basically, um, through all of our conversations on this calendar, that was probably, uh, those two days were the biggest change on the calendar from the previous year. So this went rather smoothly, and I think we all left the meeting pretty comfortable with it. It was the student that was opposed to it also. The student felt that they were a waste in the middle of the week and would be much better well, at the I end of the week. I think the student said that she would go um, either way. It wasn't that she was opposed to it. What was, the, um, what was the intent coming out of the calendar committee? The last couple of years anyway, I know that we've presented it and then we've kind of sat back and let people digest it. There were um, a couple of proposals that were fairly significant. Um, this doesn't look to be a big change. Was it, was it the expectation that the board would vote on this this evening and that it's been widely enough shared or the representatives I think the felt comfortable enough? The feeling was there weren't huge issues of changes but that in the past it has come back if the board had issues, so they would deal with it if it came back, and if it didn't come back, fine, it was done. I mean, it was sort of... Parents are very anxious to make vacation plans, so I think if you and feel able to make the decision tonight, it'll be very helpful. And, and as I said, I think the committee members felt comfortable with this and felt that this would be, you know, it would be nice that they, they couldn't see, I mean, we went through every month, every um, day, every vacation day, they couldn't see reasons, you know, why it would be rejected. Okay. Time. They all made a good case. They were very appreciative that they were heard and that mm -hmm. they were listened to very intently. And they felt that they, when they went out of that meeting, that they were very, very convinced that this was the best route to go. Good. Okay. Um, and given all that information, then uh, is there a motion? I move that we accept the school calendar for the 1999-2000 school year as presented. Is there a second? Marie, um, discussion, questions, comments. Uh, just a quick question: How many, uh, how many early release days are there? Three. Three. It's one increase from this year. We are adding an early release day for staff development because there's two in there for conferences, and that would be the change. And that was what the discussion focused around. And it wasn't that we didn't need the early release date; it was simply on the placement of it. Okay. Sue? Would April 5th also be a no AM or a Yes. Nope. Yes. No. I'm oh. sorry. Wait, no, wait. No, no. I'm no, sorry. just the ones with conferences were the no AM kindergarten. Yeah, they'd be AM, Sue, so not PM. Okay. So and that was just the ones that are noted. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, any other comments or questions yeah, from the that, board? That change was because the teachers, the number of conferences the teachers had to do, that's why we did it for the two conference days. None. Uh, public comment on this calendar? Excuse me, I think there was one other item that was discussed, and that was the last day of school would be an early release day. I'm sorry, you're, you're correct. Right. Yes, you're correct. Right. The 19th would also be an early, well, whatever the last day of school. school is, right. if, it's the, if we have five snow days, it would be the 19th. And that was an early release date, you're correct. And they were very appreciative of that gesture. Yeah. Um, That's seeing the same as this year, right? Yes. yes. Well, no, this yeah. year's calendar. Is early release the last? I think there is early release. Yes. I checked it. Yeah. I think yes. so. OK, moving right along and seeing no further comment, um, I would then call for a vote. All those in favor of adopting this calendar? Looks like it's 7-0. <coughs> we'll move on now to uh, the policies for the first reading. And Kevin, can you uh, walk us through those? Sure. Uh, the first policy um, out for first reading relates to class size. We re-looked at the class size, uh, changed some of the language. Um, I guess for some people, the recommended class size is the critical portion of this policy. And that would be kindergarten is 18, grades 1 and 2 at 20, grades 3 through 12 at 22. These are not, so, it is not anyone's intention to carve these numbers in stone, but to use them in, as guidelines. More critical, I think, to other people looking at this is the fact that we formally adopt the circuit breaker situation that was used to resolve the kindergarten issue several years ago. At any point, we project that a class size will exceed the recommended size. The superintendent um, 
is expected to consult immediately with the appropriate building administrators and review all of the issues related to that class size. Um, and this is the first time that that's been formally adopted. It's just been sort of a, a thing that we did with the kindergarten. And to me, that's the more critical piece of this policy is requiring that any time we exceed the recommended class size that we look at the issue immediately rather than leave everyone hanging. That's the first policy. Are there any questions? I just want to clarify that it means that there will be discussion about it. It doesn't guarantee Absolutely. action. Absolutely. Just, a, uh, just a, a technical comment. When, when, these, when these get changed, it's, it's helpful to, to have us see exactly what it is that's changed. Because um, and, and, I know that some of the language at the bottom has been, has been changed. Um, have, what about the numbers? Have we changed? Have we? Have we? Those numbers are essentially the same. They're the same. Okay. Yeah. Usually, I put the changes in bold type. Right. But the language was changed so much on this one that it didn't make sense to try to figure out what to put in bold. So I just it's Did the whole really thing. basically different. I understand. Basically the same, but a lot of. You've just spoiled us, and <laughs> that's right. Spoiled me anyway, because I'm used to just looking at the bold to see what's changed. I couldn't figure out a way to do it. I'm sorry. The next policy is authorization to commit district funds for special education. Claire, I may need your help with this one. Essentially, when a uh, student goes to a pet uh, pupil, pupil evaluation team meeting and that student has been identified as special needs, an individual at that pet meeting must be able to commit district resor uh, school resources, district resources. And we have opted to more clearly define at what level what people may commit uh, resources to that individual student. And our, uh, our recommendations are that on an, for in-school resources that the following individuals um, be permitted to commit those resources, and that would be building principals, <coughs> building assistant principals, special ed team leaders, director of special education or the superintendent. For in-district resources, which would not be necessarily in school. It would be building principals, building assistant principals, director of special education, and the superintendent. And finally, for uh, community and out of district resources, uh, the individuals who could commit to those are the director of special education and the superintendent. Questions on that policy? Oh, by the way, this is an entirely new policy. Right. Okay, and last is an amendment to long-term and short-term substitute professional staff employment, which um, was only revised as recently as November 10th, 1998, as to increase the salaries. Um, and Board Member Ridge suggested that the there was a major discrepancy between the period point in time when we increased the salaries and when the individual was evaluated. Increase uh, went in at, I believe, six weeks, and the evaluation was at nine weeks. This policy is simply amended to state that they're at coincidental with the increase in a long-term substitutes pay. There will be at least one written observation by a building administrator for that substitute teacher. Other uh, questions on this policy? And this is just a uh, presentation for first reading. All That's correct. There's um, no questions or any comments on these first readings, and I'm going to move ahead to consideration of administrative resignation effective at the end of the current school year. Yes, as mentioned earlier, with regret, we received the resignation from Mala Bono as the assistant principal at Pond Cove School. Uh, this is my second experience working with Myla. Myla and I worked together in another school district, so. I'm very familiar with the great contribution that she makes to any school where she works, and so it is with great regret that we accept her resignation. Comments from the board? We're not taking a formal motion. Yes, okay. Um, what I need is a motion. No one wants to give it. 
I'm no. sorry, sorry, Marla. <laughs> Tell your um, husband. Your husband can go to Florida. You'll have to stay here. I don't know what the opposite, opposite of bi-coastal yeah, is when you go north-south, but um, yeah. you'll have to work it out. Uh, I, think, I, I think we will. <laughs> I think we will get a, a motion, Beth. Could sure, you? I'll do it. Um, I would like to uh, make a motion that we accept Marla's resignation with extreme regret and wish her very well. Uh, second? I'll second. Keith, thank you. Um, discussion, comments? It, it certainly was a, a very short pleasure, but a pleasure nonetheless. Um, we uh, will miss you. We, uh, uh, we're all jealous of uh, you spending time in warm weather, um, but I think we'll, we'll uh, come to terms with that. We wish you good luck, and we do um, certainly accept this with regret. Other comments? <laughs> John? I'm just going to vote. I, uh, <laughs> I, I think she's extended an uh, invitation for us all. To all of us to John visit in Florida <laughs> around January, February time. Okay. Um, all those in favor? 7 0. We'll move on to consideration of the superintendent's nomination to athletic fee positions. Right. We have some new coaches at the high school John Beatty for assistant track, and John is a firefighter for the city of Portland and also coaches in South Portland. At the middle school, we have Lauren Wendell as assistant middle school girls lacrosse, and she is a graduate of Cape Elizabeth High School and has had extensive experience in playing lacrosse. H.B. Hoffman for seventh grade boys lacrosse, and he is a Cape Elizabeth parent. And Rebecca Curdy for middle school track, and Rebecca is currently a student teacher with us. Returning coaches, we have Paul Casey to do middle school track. And we have a coaching change in that uh, Kevin McDonald, who was originally nominated, is not able to coach. And so Chris Jackson, who originally was going to coach seventh grade, will move to eighth grade boys lacrosse. OK. Um, is there a motion? I'll make a motion that we accept the um, superintendent's recommendations for coaches. Second. Jen, thank you. Um, Comments, questions? Just a quick question. Keith, if we don't have Kevin McDonald and Chris Jackson's moving, do we are we missing somebody or not? Are we all set? We're all set. Okay. Thanks. Other questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Seven zero. We'll move on now to um, consideration of a pr proposed extended uh, girls lacrosse trip. Right. And actually, that trip has occurred, and, and you did approve, give me tentative approval for that. We did. At the uh, workshop, at the budget workshop. On so. the 23rd of March. So if we can just record in the minutes that, that that was an official action. Do you need a motion or not? Wh why don't we do it? Go ahead. Go ahead. OK, I'd make a motion that we um, ex accept retroactively <laughs> the, um, take it back. I don't know, <laughs> varsity girls lacrosse trip that happened April 2nd and 3rd. Thank you. Second? Jen, uh, discussion, none. Uh, all those in favor, 7-0 as it was on the 23rd. Um, and moving now also to um, consideration of a request from a teacher for a one-year unpaid leave of absence. Yes, yeah, so we've had a request from Kathy Walsh, who is a middle school teacher for a one-year's leave of absence. Her husband has taken a position in Arizona. And um, okay, the the recommendation from the superintendent on this is right that we not approve this. The uh, basically the concern is that we get our best pool of candidates when we have uh, permanent positions, and certainly our goal is to hire the best teachers possible. <coughs> and also the the uh, past practice has been at least three previous occasions uh, when teachers have asked for a one year leave of absence for various circumstances that the board has not approved those. Okay. Um, is there any, um, yes, Nancy. I should, oh, while she's coming up. That in no way reflects on, on Kathy as a teacher, and certainly we would be delighted to have her back if she decides to return. Right, and as the building administrator, I have a differing point of view. Um, Kathy is an excellent teacher. She's done a great job for us. This is her third year with us. And if we're gonna represent a dynamic learning 
operation, which I hope we are, and we encourage our students to try new things. I would like us all to be, also to be supportive of faculty who are doing the same thing. Um, Kathy has indicated that um, their family does have this opportunity. Um, it is a great change for them, so they want to look at it with some caution, um, even though taking advantage of it. And I would ask that you consider her request. I, we have internally advertised for our one-year position in grade six due to Gail Parker's sabbatical. And even with just our internal candidates, and we'll be advertising externally in Sunday's paper, we have a strong pool of candidates. And I do feel confident that we would be able to fill this position for one year. I agree with Cynthia's assessment that sometimes that is difficult. However, in this particular situation, I feel confident that we would be able to fill it um, for one year. We have that roving sort of bubble um, with the current fifth grade going on to sixth grade that positions would change. We would not be guaranteeing Kathy Walsh a position in grade five. We would be guaranteeing her a position um, in Cape Elizabeth in the middle school five through eight somewhere. So we're not guaranteeing her her same job um, and anything. In fact, she is slated to move on to the sixth grade if she stays with us. But I would hope that in reflection of the great job she has done for us, she's um, an exemplary teacher, as I said. She's very creative. Um, she works well with the team. She brings a lot to the curriculums that she's offered to us that we would be in support of her family's exploration of this different opportunity. I believe by the contract she would need to let us know in February if she was returning or not, and that certainly gives us ample opportunity to fill the position, which would probably not be a sixth grade position the coming year anyway. It would be more of a seventh grade position. That's where we would have um, the bubble moving up to and, and changing, um, that that would give us an opportunity to make the adjustments that we need to. I would be in support of us granting her this opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Um, in light of uh, Nancy's comments, uh, uh, but also in light of the superintendent's recommendation, uh, rather than move for a motion, I, I guess I would just like to uh, sort of poll the, the board um, in terms of the sentiments on, uh, I think the superintendent points out, and appropriately so, that um, there has been some precedent set on um, one-year leaves that are not specific, uh, specifically tied to some sort of educational experience uh, for that teacher. Um, and so, uh, again, I would just o open it for the, for the board to express uh, so I, I can get a sense as to where we're going with this thing. Um, Kathy is an excellent teacher, and I just, being in the position of the school board member, we need to run the business of schools, and um, it's very important that we are careful with the precedent we set. And after we had the issue last year with the teacher requesting a leave, we really looked at lots of policies and different ways we could put some structure to it. And we really talked about the intent would be only if it had almost the sabbatical type things, but a person wasn't qualifying for a sabbatical, that we weren't going to do it for business type ventures or those kind of things. So for those reasons, and again, it has nothing to do with Kathy. As a teacher, it only has to do with trying to um, be consistent and um, that we would only look at uh, leave of absences for almost the sabbatical type qualifications. So you would not support a motion? I would, no. <coughs> Other comments from board members? Um, I, only, I kind of just throw this out that it may be easier to fill this now. I mean, I'm guessing Kathy doesn't have to let us know for some time whether she's leaving. If, she, if she's leaving, and, you know, without any, any business of, any, any, <coughs> uh, any tie to coming back, she doesn't right. need to let us know. In which case, it may be a more difficult position to fill the closer you are the start of the school year. Mm -hmm. um, I just throw that out. <laughs> okay. It's getting late, Jen, and I know for one, I missed it. I missed that point. Well, it's she easy to fill morning. the position, the one year position. What's that? I said she thought it was morning when she arrived at 7 o'clock. So. It, it may be easier to fill the position with a lot of time. I see. In, for a one year stint. Right. Okay. I, I then, it will be to hire even on a permanent basis, you know, August 28th. Right. 
I hear what you're saying. Other, um, would you give, give us your sense of um, where you stand on this? Not yet. If, okay, if you have, <laughs> other, Keith? I, I tend to agree with Beth. Uh, Kathy is definitely a great teacher and it's been great having her here, but uh, we have to be careful of the precedents set and, uh, and also in the past few years, the ones, the, uh, the similar type requests that we've uh, ended up turning down, I, I think it would, uh, it would go against my grain if we accepted this one, so I would uh, not support it. Okay. Kevin. <clears throat> I voted consistently in favor of granting leaves, paid or otherwise, to teachers um, requesting sabbaticals and or other forms of professional development. I have consistently voted against granting any type of leave to teachers who are going out for a professional experience in another area, and I will be consistent with that tonight. Um, comments from other board members? John? I concur with Dr. Moll's recommendation. I don't think we can stop this president, we better stick with what we've done in the past and no reflection on this individual as a teacher, but we have to think of the students first and I don't know of any other profession that you can have a job waiting for you to take off for a year and expect to step back in. Okay. That's for board members uh, who will not support the motion. I, I will also listen to other comments. Um, Marie. And I think I agree with what everyone else has said and um, in Cynthia's recommendation and I think um, Everyone shares the same sentiment that Kathy is a terrific teacher, um, which means that I think the doors will always be open to her when she get, mm -hmm. if she were to come back to me. Other comments? Um, I'll just make a comment also that I, I would uh, not support this. Uh, Kathy is a friend, and I know she's also a great teacher. She is. Uh, uh, it's going to be a sad loss to our school system and a, and a sad loss of the Walsh family uh, from this community because they're taking one of my son's best friends all the way to Arizona. Um, but I would, it, again, uh, it is no reflection on the value that we place on Kathy as an employee or as a teacher. Um, it's really in uh, established precedence that, that, we, that I would also follow and support. So um, that was the last item on our agenda before we adjourn the meeting. I go back, back to the calendar for just a second to clear up a little bit of confusion, which is mostly in my own mind, I think. Uh, someone asked the question about the last day of school this year as being an early release day, and the answer to that is yes, but the reason it's different this year is that it's not the last teacher day, because we, the teachers in K-8 have another day after that, whereas next year, that last day of school, the early release day, is in fact the last day for teachers and students. So that's the difference between this year and next year. Okay. Um, it's just a quick reminder of dates to remember. The Town Council Finance Committee and School Board uh, meeting is tomorrow, April 14th. That's an important meeting at 7.30 in the Council Chambers. And the purpose of that is to review the School Board budget, which was uh, passed this evening. Um, the School Board Workshop meeting, uh, one will be happening on April 27th at 7 p.m. at the High School Library. Uh, the topic for that um, is uh, to is yet to be announced. Um, the Finance Subcommittee on May 11th, 99, um, at 6.30 in the William Jordan Conference Room, followed by the regular school board meeting at 7.30 in the Council Chambers. That's on May 11th. And um, there's also a Policy Subcommittee on Wednesday, May 5th at 9 a.m., also in the William H. Jordan Conference Room. Um, with that concluded, uh, I have a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. So moved by Beth, seconded by uh, Marie. All those in favor? 7-0. Thank you very much.